Prayers for Lent with the Book of Kells. One number one, one one four recto, the arrest image, taken from Rosemary Power's book Image and Vision. This image is one of the interesting ones that is much spoken about in the Book of Kells, often called the arrest, because we see a large figure golden-haired and brown beard, as Jesus often is, his arms outstretched, and people on each side taking hold of them. Above his head are the words in Latin, and the hymn being said, they went out into the Garden of Olives. Evil is loose here. The great beasts of passion, rending and tearing, are at the top of the arch of the world. Crosses are on each side of a head of Jesus. Below, at the bottom of that Roman colonnade, the archers have snakes, dark snakes, writhing upwards. This is a time when darkness is loose. And yet, the image has many levels and is a connector of different parts of a story of Christ's self-giving. It is on a right-hand page. Opposite it are the texts, the text of the Eucharist. What happened that night? So this image directly relates to those words where Jesus blessed, broke, took and gave. And here you see him being lifted up above the arch of the world, above the power of the Roman Empire, his arms and legs making a salty cross. In fact, the two people on each side may look fierce, arresting guards at first view, but they are not dressed like guards, but in priestly garments. As Jesus is in red and blue, they too are in flowing robes of silk. Their feet can be seen and their legs. And they may also be upholding Jesus, as Moses was, had his arms upheld. Or they could be two priests breaking as they bless the bread at the Eucharist, as we know happened at this time. They could, of course, be in the book in Gethsemane and above their heads grow olives out of pots a reference to an obscure passage in Habakkuk. Or again, could these be the false witnesses before the high priest, where Jesus is silent, and they remind too of the two thieves on the cross sharing with Jesus in that crucifixion. In all events, Jesus is being lifted up by them, coming towards the onlooker, towards us. And if the intention is to say that Eucharist, Garden of Gethsemane with its anguish, trials and crucifixion are all part of the Eucharistic giving and thanksgiving. There is also here the resurrection, but this is part of a story, not the complete one. Folio 183R 
It was the third hour. The crucifixion in Mark's Gospel. This extraordinary page has no complete border, but two side borders, and within it part of the text. In Latin, erat tertia ora. Not easy to read, in the jagged, distorted writing we find at times of great pain in the Book of Kells. And yet, embellished in brilliant um, yellows which take the form of gold, in deep blues, it is in one sense an immensely attractive page, but a strange one. In the midst of the words, an angel comes down, apparently seated on air, just touching the side panels, holding out the book of the scriptures. This is how it was. Within the great first letter of the E of Erat is a small lion facing snakes but appearing astonished by what is happening. At the end of that first word Erat is a great snake, the basilisk perhaps, the king's snake. Strangely of all, at the top right-hand corner as we look, is a head, youthful, curly-haired, looking over. Who is this figure popping up as if from nowhere? So if we look to the bottom left-hand corner, we see the end of a long robe and feet. At this the third hour, when Jesus is crying out in Mark's Gospel, is something else happening. This is the only illustration in Mark's Gospel that has survived, um, a main text page, perhaps because its strangeness made it left. It was the least used of the scriptures. Matthew mainly for the Passion, Luke for Gentile Gospel for Resurrection. But here we have the Lion, the King of Animals, also the Mark of Mark, the Evangelist, the Basilisk, the Angel from Afar, and this strange figure, the feet walking towards the centre, the eyes looking outwards, perhaps towards us. Are the two golden pillars on each side the veil of the temple? Is it about to be rent so we see behind the words into the sanctuary? And in the sanctuary, the Jesus parted and given at the Last Supper, killed at the crucifixion, is here at the moment of death, body join together again as feet and head unite behind the words, the face of the invisible Christ. There are many more details in this um, image, including the small litany in red at the bottom, continued on the next page. It was a great moment of stillness in the early monastic community a time when a new text was opened, the key text of our faith. A repeat of the last words. It is something special, perhaps used occasionally, but a glory an understanding of the third hour when the creatures of the desert, the wild beasts, are with Christ in this desert, where behind the text he will rejoin and our desert will be flowering.
It was the third hour. It was the third hour. The temple shamed and absence came and reigned. It was the third hour of ancient stain against the name of humankind ingrained, engraved on palms. The angel came, the robe of flame, the lion, the snake and basilisk enraged as all the desert trials and trails ran out their course. Six hours of labour till the watchers left, the women on the hill were still. The temple fell and joined and formed. The pillars soaked, the golden oak held up the absent veil where silence flowed. The way regained. Reflection 3. The Crucifixion. Folio 124, Matthew's Gospel. This is a text page. It says, Tunc crucificerant Jesus Christi et cum eos duas ladrones. Then they crucified Christ and with him two thieves. Part of the text, an opening of one of the great readings. On a right hand recto page, we see this image, much of it in dark blues, that most expensive colour, woad, locally produced by long processes. The very words form a saltire cross. And what is happening here? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We have the great beast of passion, like a lion rending and tearing. The beast in the centre of the T has great teeth and is entangled with snakes, perhaps those snakes that represent us human beings in the Book of Kells, and a tiny cat, trapped, is spitting out red dots like blood, cats so often part of a monastic life. Down the side panel is a lion with a great roar coming from its mouth. It too is, is part of this moment. The claws of a great beast of the tea hang backwards and forwards, each touching something, for there is the usual unity here. Three sets of figures look away to the, Vince, to the left hand page, which is blank. As the text was continuous, this page was left deliberately blank, presumably to form a double image, an image of a crucifixion, which was never made. Perhaps the people were injured or killed or enslaved who would have been involved in the great work of creating this book, from gathering seashells for dyes to preparing them, to making inks, to assisting the great artists and writers who made this book. Perhaps it was left blank in their honour. Meanwhile, this page has been treated with great respect. There are elaborate patterns in the background made of red dots like blood, highlighting the yellow and the deep blue. So these people look towards a blank page, but we have the unification of this one. And as in all images of the crucifixion, the passion of Jesus in this book, 
in the panels in the border at the bottom are some tiny peacocks, the sign of the resurrected Christ. In the midst of darkness is the hope of the resurrection. Book of Kells, Folio 285R, the first day of the week in Luke's Gospel. This is the resurrection page. Light with the colours of spring, pale mauves, yellows, green, this is a sudden joyous page in Luke's Gospel, the Gentile Gospel. It is a text page as we see from the line above and in our second line within the panelled border. The other text is simply writing from the previous page which has come through over the centuries. But to look at this light, glorious illumination taking up most of the page. It is the first day of a week, Una, first, the one, unique, the unifier, Una. From out of the great you come two peacocks rising confidently, gloriously upwards Pass to pass through the entanglement of delicate interlace and out into glorious freedom. These references of the resurrection are Jesus rising out of the tomb. Here they are on the page, the word rising out of the word and the word being the one, the unifier. They are also rising off the very vellum of which is the story is written. On each side are four angels, as we find elsewhere in the Book of Kells. Here they are sitting, lolling about, as if blitzed. Three of them are looking away. Another is looking beyond, into the depths. Three are sitting on the very letters. They've had a complete unexpected surprise. They remind us too of the guards in Matthew's Gospel who were set on the tomb of Jesus and lay like dead men with astonishment at the time of resurrection. On the second line below the Una there is an M but it is formed not in the usual way but out of the same letter, but out of the form of a Coptic cross that is found in Jerusalem in the Holy Sepulchre, the two-armed cross, here with a bar on each side. Everything points to that first resurrection in Jerusalem and all it meant, as the reader, the viewer and us today are part of seeing the resurrection again and again and again. One incident, Una, forever. The borders of the page at the top right have a beast, but unlike the beast that followed through the dark passion of Matthew, here it is a pantomime beast, colourful, roaring harmlessly off the page into oblivion. This beast has teeth but could harm nobody. Its tongue is entangled in interlace. It is part of a joyous pattern. Even darkness and evil are part of the pattern. It has a little ball on its nose. This one will harm nobody. The rest of the interlace is entwined in small letters, small forms of birds, which are snakes, which become birds. A reminder that we, the snakes, those who crawl on this earth, 
can also partake of the resurrection and after this life we become the birds of paradise. Lifted from the ground, we are the creatures of eternity. And we do it intertwined, interlinked in community. There are other elements. The top line is the end of the text of Jesus being laid in the tomb and says that the Sabbath being come, the women arrested. And then, within the very interlace and border come the word mandatum, as it is commanded. For it is commanded in the Ten Commandments that we rest on the Sabbath. But here the commanded is also the also ordained for more time. For the resurrection also is ordained, commanded from the start. And there is no differential, there is a continuity between the death of Jesus, his laying in the tomb, the resting on the Sabbath, and very early on the first morning, Jesus returning. A reflection on the first morning. In the dew after Jesus tumbled out of a tomb, Jephthah's daughter, in the bloom before womanhood, graced by her name and forgave. Two thieves came like brothers arms crossing shoulders, one still calling Jesus by his own given name. Naaman, once leper, was led by the daughter to those she'd been torn from, where pain turned to laughter and tales of God joy. Sad-hearted Judas, clinging to shadows, slipped sideway, recalling God's praise as he faced his own failings. A wonder of prophets, once sold for prophets of priests passing by without comfort. Those killed in the fields, in the cradle at prayer, from Abel to infants and kings. Like shadows in sunshine, dissolved and reformed, learning to live with love without end. Let's finish. Reflection 5. Christ Portrayed. Folio 32v. This so-called portrait of Christ is a text page. An image is not a text page. It is an image near the front of the Book of Kells. Not long before the opening to Matthew's Gospel. No, sorry, start that again. Reflection 5. Folio 32R, 32V. The Portrait of Christ. The image on this page is a portrait. It's not a text page, but an illumination of another kind to reflect on. It comes in Matthew's Gospel at what's called the second opening, after the genealogy at the start of the story of the birth of Jesus. Not long before it has come the portrait of Matthew, very similar in style, but in soft pink purple colours, while here Christ is portrayed in all brilliance. It is an elaborate page with a deep margin the use of many colours. Christ here portrayed as he was in the Northern Hemisphere as red-haired, gold with red in it, bearded, dressed as always in a red garment above a blue one, feet bare in this holy place, holding up the scriptures to us. In the side panels are figures winged but apparently the four evangelists. 
and we are there too in tiny detail. The snakes that slough off their skin each year as we slough off sin and draw upwards together, entwined towards redemption. In this image, the youthful Christ has no halo, but the symbols instead. His head is joined by a cross to the upper arch, the arch of the world. Within it, a small black box may refer to the relic box found in every Christian altar. On each side is a peacock, each slightly different, for the Book of Kells never replicates, but harmonises difference. They fit well into the arch of the world, a reminder of the resurrection of which they are symbols. On each of their breasts is a consecrated Eucharistic host. Beneath their feet and touching them are cups, chalices, holding grapes and olives those which are to be transformed into the wine of the Eucharist, the olive of healing. In Matthew's Gospel, the feet of the evangelist are placed neatly touching the roundels at the bottom of the page. In this one, however, one foot touches the roundel and one overlaps slightly. At first sight, it might seem an artist's error. And yet, although Christ is in the seating position of teaching, he is also standing and walking towards us as on the first morning. This tiny detail is no mistake, but a reminder that the Christ who looks us in the face comes towards us in greeting, holding a hand in blessing, two fingers raised, holding the scriptures as guide, and having around his head all those references to the passion as he comes towards us on the first morning. <laughs>